Good evening, Gateway community, friends, alumni, family, <laughs> fans of Gateway. We are all of those things. Yes, and we're here to, first of all, introduce ourselves. I am Jason Flom. I'm Allison Flom. And my mom was Claire Flom, um, the founder, of course, of the fabulous Gateway School. And I we have a very special presentation for you. But before that, I just want to give you a little story that you may already know. So stop me if you, no, don't stop me. <laughs> I'm going to tell it anyway. Um, so my mom, Claire, was a very determined woman. Um, and my brother, Peter, my older brother, was a uh, was born almost three months premature, uh, didn't, no, almost didn't survive. Uh, when he did survive, the doctor said to my mom, he looks like he's going to survive, but he's never going to go to college or anything like that. He's never going to have a normal life. So just, you know, lower your expectations, in other words, right? So my mom, as my brother got, you know, to be a uh, out, of out of being a toddler, she found that she couldn't get him into any schools in New York City. He couldn't go to the schools for kids with a certain type of challenges, which they used to call retardation or whatever, and he couldn't go to a regular school. So she decided to start a school with Elizabeth Freitas as her one uh, teaching a person, teacher, she started the gateway school in the, school in the basement of a church. Um, my brother was the first student. And when he graduated and got his PhD in psychometrics, he invited that doctor to come to his graduation uh, ceremony. I don't know. Someone asked me the other day, did the doctor actually come? I don't know the answer to that. If I did, I would tell you, but I don't. So, um, to this day, I, I have the wonderful experience on a frequent basis of running into someone either in the music business that I'm in or on the golf course or on the street who says the Gateway School transformed my child and my family's life. Um, and it's so beautiful every time I hear that and I still feel my mom's presence. This little girl here was the light of my mom's life. They had a, an extraordinary relationship and um, I'm really glad that she lived to see her grow into the young woman that she has become. And uh, we miss her. But um, so now for the presentation. Well, can I add to that? Please do. Okay, I also just wanted to say my extremely cool grandma, um, I think saw learning differences as not only an opportunity, but a superpower. And she wanted to tap into the infinite capacity and opportunity and potential that lies in every single developing mind. Um, and I think she, the way that she treated people, I mean, it's true, I was her sunshine. She was the nicest to me, like more than anyone else. Um, but I think the way that she treated people had that in mind and Gateway continues to embody her integrity and her kind of like life mission in its daily work. It was so cool to do a reading of what we're about to show you at Gateway in person almost two years ago um, and to meet the team and to see the facility and to know that my grandma had started the school, as my dad said, in one room of the basement of a church in the 60s. And now it has grown into this like thriving, flourishing um, community that, you know, treats learners the way that my grandma would want them to be treated and wanted my dad's brother, Peter, to be treated. Um, so we are here to talk about inclusion and using storytelling for social change and thinking about how we use stories and characters to start conversations and to connect and to have difficult conversations, uh, which is the reason that we wrote a children's book, which my dad is about to introduce to you. Which is on my shirt, um, Lulu is right now. I thought you were just showing off shirt. your posture. Here. So yeah, I, my posture. I'm well, I also have good posture sometimes. So anyway, um, so so Lulu is a rhinoceros. Um, so we wrote this book, um, and I'm going to tell you the origin story of how it came to be. See, the book came to be because I work with an organization I'm on the board of an organization called VETPAW, which is Veterans Empowered to Protect African Wildlife, U.S. military veterans on the ground in South Africa, saving rhinos, arresting poachers, breaking up poaching rings, and you know, providing a future for these magnificent creatures who are the closest thing we have on earth to dinosaurs in my view and um it's really a, a beautiful thing that they're doing they're amazing people i was over there with them several years ago on the ground and i got to get up close and personal with actual rhinoceroses and it was an unbelievable experience i, I got to hug and kiss a rhino and i came home and i was sitting on the couch with my bulldog lulu and i said i was telling her about my trip um, because I talked to my dog. And if you're a dog lover, you know what I mean by that, <laughs> because you probably do too. And anyway, so I was talking to Lulu and I was telling her about the trip. 
And she looks me right in the eye and she says, well, I'm a rhinoceros too. And I said, what are you talking about? You're obviously a dog. You're small and furry and you're on my couch. She looks me right back in the eye and says, can't you see? I have short legs, a big body and a flat head. I only run fast for short distances and I'm clumsy and I burp and snore and fart like a rhino. I don't even know if I could say that on this Zoom. <laughs> and she said, I'm a rhino. So I said, well, in that case, let's tell the story. So I had this vision. My daughter, Allison, who you've now met, is an actual writer. I'm not a writer. Um, so I asked her if she would write the book with me and she did. And it has, it's, our thought was if we can create a little hero for kids who feel left out, put down or bullied, because the way they look, the way they feel, or the way they are, let's do that. And I'm happy to say that the feedback and the reactions, and it's become a hit book, and uh, this is top secret, so we'll just keep it between the 500 of us, whatever there is. But we have made a deal with Apple Plus for the animated TV series, which will be coming out next year. So we're super excited about that. It's a and musical. It's a musical. It's a musical animated show. It's going to be so fun. So that's why um, we're so excited to be able to present this book, which has provided us with so much joy and so many children with so much joy, and this little hero, Lulu, um, who may be actually making a cameo on this Zoom after the reading, so stay tuned. That's the um, opposite of how a surprise works. Oh, whoops. <laughs> it's literally the well, definition of what we were told not act, to do. Amazing. Act, act surprised. Okay, please. Okay, so anyway, so I'll now, act really surprised now we're going to read Lulu is a Rhinoceros. Okay, this is... Here we go, and you can. Thank you. Read along. That's the cover. Yes. Read along. Allison is going to play Lulu, and I'm going to play all the other animals. Are you ready for that? Yeah. Am I? Are they ready for it? That's really do the it. question. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. Okay. It's been a minute okay. since we performed live. Ready? Yes, I am Lulu. What I'm not is a bulldog. In fact, I'm not a dog at all. Can you guess what I am? I'm a rhinoceros. In my heart. I have thick gray rhino skin, but what I really have is soft fuzzy fur. In my mind, I have a tail that whips and twirls, but what I see is a little nub that wiggles when I'm happy. The only thing I don't have yet that I really, really, really want is my rhino horn. And there you see her pointing to the picture of the rhino on the wall. So here we go. Hi, I'm a rhinoceros. Eek. I'm a rhinoceros. Are you some kind of freak? I'm a rhinoceros. Do you think I can't see? I am a rhinoceros. You don't look like one to me. If only I had my horn, they'd finally see the real me. Let's try this ice cream cone on for size. I think it would be a pretty cool horn. Uh, not cool, cold brain freeze. Two dollars, please. And then she tries on a sock. She's trying on whatever she can find to change what she looks like. So she tries on this sock and says, I don't think rhino horns are supposed to be this floppy or stinky. A traffic cone, that might work. And then she gets stuck inside the traffic cone and says, well, I can't see a thing. I guess this banana will have to do. And she walks around all proud with her banana horn, but the other, but she's met with the other animals are laughing at her, making fun of her or ignoring her, treating her with disrespect. It's very, and then she gets sadder and sadder until the pigeon comes along. And then Lulu says, Do you know who I am? Yeah, you're, you're a bulldog with, with a banana on your nose. So she has this banana on her nose because she's trying so hard to prove who she is to other people because others don't see her the way that she sees herself. So she says back to the pigeon, no, I'm a, and then the pigeon snatches her horn and she says, that's my horn. I need that. And now Lulu has really just reached bottom. The, the other uh, pigeons are bullying her. They're all ganging up on her. And finally she says, that's enough. I've had it with the pigeons, I've had it with the dogs, I've had it with everyone. And she chases the pigeon through the streets and she yells out, she yells out, That's my horn! It's a banana! And she runs past the garbage and rats and mice because it is New York City after all and the horses and she says, Give me back my horn! 
And then she chases the pigeon into the New York City Zoo, right past the sign that says no dogs allowed, because the sign doesn't mean anything because to her because she doesn't identify as a dog. And the pigeon says, it's a banana. And they run past the, well, the giraffes and the zebras. And they chase the pigeon past the gibbons and the elephants. And Lulu says, it's my horn because I'm a rhinoceros. And she thinks to be a rhinoceros, she has to have a horn. And the pigeon drops the banana into the rhino enclosure as if to say, yeah, well, if you're really a rhinoceros, let's just see about that. And then Lulu has suddenly hearts in her eyes because she realizes she's home. And she is now there's a, a tick bird comes along and the tick bird says, you're a peculiar looking rhino. Did you say rhino? I am a rhino. How did you know? Well, we're in the rhinoceros enclosure, so of course you're a rhino. That's right. I am. My name's Lulu. Who are you? I'm Flom Flom. I'm a tick bird. Every rhino has a tick bird, and every tick bird has a rhino. Um, except for me, that is. Well, I don't have a tick bird. Well, says the tick bird, if you need me. And if you need me, then, then why, why don't, don't we... we and they join forces and they get together. And finally. Yes, I am Lulu. I am a rhinoceros. And that is my the favorite end slide. Of the book. That yes. last one. <laughs> that's Allison's favorite slide. My favorite is Lulu with her paws up in the air. Um, so that's the book. Um, and we are super excited to present it to you. We and, yeah. just heard that it's going to be in the uh, in the Gateway Book Fair, which is wonderful. We're so, so grateful for that. And now I've been told that we're allowed to take some questions, which I'm really... Question, some of the questions from the audience already are, like, here. So um, I guess, you know, the overview of the theme central lessons just, you know, it, it is clear. And I want to, like, mostly get to your other questions, but um, we wanted to write about, as my dad said, like self-acceptance and this is a, and self-celebration and um, allyship. And I think there's really no question of who she is or whether she likes herself or believes in herself throughout the whole story. It's when there's allyship and when another character recognizes her innate rhino-ness that she's able to claim who she is again and not feel like she needs to find a horn or do anything to like change what she looks like to prove anything and it's more about like making um herself feel like herself and claiming you know who she is as i said so um these are some of the questions okay and then um do we want to have lulu do her cameo now her big uh, uh... the big surprise <laughs> lulu where are you yeah, I guess let's let's bring Lulu let's on look, the virtual stage. Yeah, real rhinoceros. Oh wow, show. she's so riveted. <laughs> she's excited about this reading. She got so excited that she just conked out. Fell right to sleep. That's what she does best. She sleeps a lot. So um, there's Lulu the rhinoceros, and now we can take the questions. So, yeah, um, how do we learn to be true to ourselves and the most confident versions of ourselves? For me, it's about who we surround ourselves with. Um, and if we can be around people who bring out the things that we like most about ourselves, it's a lot easier to tap into the things we like most about ourselves. I wish I understood that in high school. I wish I didn't spend so much time in my life um, trying to be the best version of myself around people who inherently kind of blocked that or didn't allow that being to be, you know, flourishing. Um, and so the best way I think to really get into our confident best version of ourselves is to be really mindful of like who we're with and um, the kind of reciprocal energy in the friendships and relationships that we hold. Um, yeah, I just like to say it's a great question and thank you to whoever wrote it. But um, and one thing, something that someone said to me once was when I was sort of wondering about that myself, somebody said, gave me the best advice. They said to go look in the mirror and say out loud, I'm important and I matter and then act like it. So I think it, it seems silly to say it out loud to yourself in the mirror, but do it because... I wrote that on my tack board in there when well, I was in high school, go. remember? You, you made me write that on my tack board, no, actually, I but I, okay. it counts. It was helpful. So Discuss, audience questions. Oh, um, yeah. How yeah. old is Lulu? Does she have any animal friends? What does Lulu like to do? Yeah. Characterization. So Lulu. Lulu is eight and a half years old. 
Um, so she rides a skateboard. She loves to ride a skateboard. She has some other doggy friends. Um, I don't know if she has any other animal friends that are not um, canine. But um, yeah, those are some of her things. And she loves to nap and be petted. And she's a very, very affectionate little doggy. And she has a huge personality. So um, she's very confident. I think, and some of the reason why we've like built this character around her is because it is, I feel like easier for any type of learner to connect to and remember a character, especially when it has to do with difficult conversations. And when we don't want to see certain things about ourselves or when something is really hard, um, it's easier, I think, to see those hard things in stories. And I've always loved stories. And I also have had stories that have stuck with me throughout my entire life because of the central themes and lessons or because of what the character was dealing with at the time. And I think if we can see our ourselves in Lulu and we can see Lulu as a hero, then we can claim, you know, that part of ourselves. I keep saying this, like claiming who I am thing, but I also, this is an answer to a later question, but one of the, both me and my dad like to do a lot of things. He's taught me to be in all the industries and try to, you know, improve lives with everything that you do. And, um, on Mondays and Tuesdays, I facilitate uh, like arts workshops for incarcerated women. And today uh, the workshop was on claiming our own identity and all of the participants kind of mapped out their identity on like blank, just drawings of people, sort of like gingerbread man shaped people um, and just wrote about their assets and the things that they liked about themselves. And it was so cool to hear them share and to remind all each other and empower each other um, that we are in charge of our identity and we can change that whenever we want. We can change what we say about ourselves, what we believe to be true about ourselves. We can take or leave what other people say about us, but at the end of the day, we have to be um, empowered within like ourselves. So all this to say, we wanted to not use Lulu, but let Lulu be a catalyst for conversations for young people because young people stop her on the street, young people connect to her and connect to this kind of upbeat, self-assured character. Um, and it's easier to talk about Lulu than it is to, I think, talk about like ourselves sometimes. So Lulu was definitely the inspiration for this entire universe of characters and questions that have been built around her. Oh my God, so many questions that have just appeared. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you. I th So many nice things, so many nice things. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, look, um, Gabriel's on and everything. Um, so I read this book all the time. It reminds me that being different is a great thing. Give Lulu a hug from Yeah, that's Better Gabriel. What a wonderful oh. kid. It's an amazing, amazing story. Um, but she's Better Gabriel. I'm so happy you're here. Um, oh my God, it's so weird to not know like who is here. So, okay, I'm gonna read you um, okay, more a few more questions. This one's for you, like Christmas. This, I'm gonna oh. ask you this one. Oh. Um, Jason, how can someone get involved with fighting for the wrongfully convicted or the Innocence Project? Do you know anything about those things? Yes, I know a little bit about that. Oh, so, cool, cool, cool. Um, I am the founding board member of the Innocence Project. So I've been there almost since the beginning. Um, it is truly uh, my calling and um, it's a super important and dynamic and wonderful organization. Oh, look, Lulu perked up talking about the Innocence Project. Mm -hmm. um, so innocenceproject.org is a great place to go. They have ways you can get involved there. You can also follow me on Instagram, which is it's Jason Flom, I-T-S Jason Flom, um, where I talk about these things uh, and often put links for things that people can do. Um, and there's so many, so many great things. I mean, there's, you, you can write letters to people uh, in prison. You can, um, Allison did that. We worked together on a death penalty case uh, 11 years ago, uh, successfully, happily. Um, and Allison became pen pals with a guy's name was Kevin Keith in Ohio. But and we also like, were really focused on petitions at that point. And like, we had a party and I like was little, but I like wouldn't let people in unless they like signed our petition. <laughs> Right. Um, just, you know, con people into helping. Yeah. So, free the um, innocent. yeah, I mean, it, it's a huge, what about your podcast? yeah. On oh, the podcast, of course. Thank you for mentioning that. So I host a podcast called wrongful conviction. Um, it's been downloaded about 25 million times so far. So, and actually we just got nominated for, uh, several Webby awards. We got three nominations plus a couple of honors. So, it, it, I think that podcast is really as an entry point. You can learn a lot and meet some of the people on there who have been wrongfully convicted and hear their stories. Uh, we interview people who are in prison as well as people who've gotten out. Um, so I think that's really a great place to start. So the podcast is called Wrongful Conviction. 
And um, yeah, I'm really proud of it, mainly because uh, the people that I interview are just absolutely extraordinary. And then somebody else asked, um, did, what are your favorite new mu music artists and or podcasts? Do you well, wanna... also, you're about to produce my podcast as well. Oh, well, but that's not mm. out yet. People can't listen to it. But Allison has her own podcast coming out. That's be true. Really, really I've been cool. researching a murder trial for three years that I am writing about. And my dad is building out the wrongful conviction universe of podcasts to scripted storytelling, which is my main jams. So that is called Erased. Um, and it is about women heroes throughout history who have been erased. Um, okay, this says love that you two work together on this would we collaborate again on any future projects oh no well, no i'm just kidding um so yeah we're doing this other we're doing so many things because we're sorry we're writing um a special of lulu a musical tv show for apple tv my dad is producing and also playing the judge spoiler alert in my scripted podcast coming up we like working together. We have a good time. Yeah, we, we have a good working relationship. We just finished the Lulu is a Rhinoceros um, script actually 45 minutes ago. Yeah, right about 45 minutes here. ago. Yeah, so it was a fire drill to get it done before we got on here, but it was really it was really fun and it's going to be I think it's going to be terrific and um yeah, and and yeah, and it's it's Lulu is a Rhinoceros the TV show. So very exciting. Okay, this says do you think the bird at the end of the journey Lulu went on or the journey Lulu met on to, to meet the bird was more effective in conveying the lesson of self-empowerment and allyship. Oh, her meeting with Flom Flom or the actual journey. I mean, I the meeting with the tick bird, you're right on, is the like the absolute most important part, I think, because it's like the epitome of allyship. Like we, any person who reads this has the opportunity to be an ally or to not be an ally. And if we zoom out and ask, especially in the classroom, um, what makes Flom Flom an ally, you know, and what does Flom Flom do? It really is just a matter of saying, yeah, I said you're a rhino because you said you're a rhino, right? It's not a big complicated thing where she has to say like, yes, please listen to me. Like, do you see who I am? Do you think that I've proven myself enough? Flom Flom, just by saying you're, you're in the rhino enclosure, like she's like, did you say that I'm a rhino? And Flom Flom, and in the TV show, Flom Flom, the character will actually be saying like, yeah, you said you're a rhino. And that is the simple, the bare bones of allyship is just to have the kind of tolerance where if someone says who they are to not question or push back or make judgments. And if anything, to replace any judgment with curiosity. And if we can empower young learners to be curious about the things that they don't understand, then they'll go and be curious at school and ask their friends. And it's not all the pressure on the educator, all the pressure on the parents to teach things or start conversations that are extremely hard. And I would just say, lastly, that I'm really grateful for my well-rounded education and uh, what my grandparents, my dad's parents really embodied, which is like, we can get an education from any situation. And I feel like so much of what I know is from school, from my parents, from the books I've read, from the entertainment that I've been to, ex like been exposed to. And all through that, I've been told, be curious instead of judgmental, ask questions. And because I was empowered to ask questions, I'm able to learn all that much more. I feel like Gateway does such an immaculate job of creating curious learners. Um, so sweet, by the way, Eliane Sadell uh, mentioned that uh, it was amazing. The kids still talk about the visit and hearing you both share the story. Yeah, we went, we actually did a reading at the school uh, about three years ago with the questions Lulu. were the best. Yeah, yeah Lulu was on the skateboard. Oh my God, they were so awesome. I don't know if, yeah. Oh, there she is. She has moved all the way from her bed to another area of the floor. She has an extremely complicated life, obviously. She's more famous than I am. Um, Instagram wise and otherwise, I would say people are a lot more likely to ask either of us on any given day how Lulu's doing than how each other's doing. So um, she definitely keeps us humble. Um, and it's wonderful to see a father daughter so engaged. Can you give any advice on how to bolster a parent child relationship? Well, I feel like um, it's hard to like think about things you've done right, but there are a few. It's mm. kind of crazy. Oh, that's very kind of you. I would say um, mm. honestly, like being, I know this might be like controversial, but I think like being a friend to, to, or I, who am I to talk about parenting? My experience, and I really like both my parents and I did, I think they did a great job and I literally choose to spend all my time with my parents at 26 years old. I'm extremely cool, um, but also it's because they have been friends to me and they've like set a precedent that I want to tell them. Like, I feel like if, you know, I feel like you've taught me well several things, like I can always come home, like wherever you are is like a home 
Um, and then also that, you know, I mean, you've taught me innumerable things, Pops, but just that it's cooler to like come to you, even if I think it's bad, than to like have secrets. And I think like secrecy is sometimes the opposite of kindness. Um, and indifference is the opposite of love. It's it's when we tap out and think we can just have secrets and complacency that um, relationships are sacrificed. Yeah, just a few things I would add to it. Not that I'm any kind of expert, but I did get lucky on the parenting side. Um, so my dad told me, and my brother, by way of advice, my dad was a you know legendary uh, corporate attorney. Um, and when people would say, why didn't you go into law? I would tell them, my dad said to my brother and I, the career advice he gave us was do whatever you want to do, try to be the best at it, but just make the world a better place. If you do that, that then you'll be a success in my eyes. So I've told that to my kids as well. And fortunately, they've taken that advice to heart. I also told them from when they were little that um, if they ever witness bullying, I expect them to take the side of the oppressed, um, not to necessarily put themselves in harm's way, but always to be on the side of the oppressed, not the oppressor. And Another important thing that I learned and everything I learned someone else told me is that, um, as Allison referenced, I said to them when they were little, if you're ever in a situation where you're uncomfortable or feel uh, in danger in any re way for any reason, pick up the phone and call me and I'll come get you. No questions asked. I won't you won't be in trouble no matter what you may or may not have done to cause the situation to get to where it is. Um, it won't it won't be judged and it won't be uh, it won't be, um, you know, uh, there won't be any consequences. It's just I just want to know that I can make sure that I can come and get you and that you'll be safe. And I think this is a really important uh, thing that someone else told me. Uh, the only other thing I'll say is that some a, a parent who had a, a kid at Fieldston, I went to Fieldston so did many I. years before I did. Um, uh, uh, my kids did. Uh, said to me, you know, I remember everything my kids ever did that I didn't go to, but I don't remember any of the reasons why I didn't go. So I've tried, you know, as much as possible to to be present for whatever, you know, if they're in band or, you know, in, in some other kind of paralysis, I've always done theater. So yeah, those are just some, uh, some off the cuff um, parenting things that I learned from other people. So I'm passing them on. Um, okay, we got another question. Um, did you always want to be a writer from um, Nicole? Oh, um, I always wanted to be a storyteller. My my dad's really good at storytelling, but I was like, I was around a lot of just really good stories, like entertainment wise. And I grew up in the music business and I was always around a lot of like just characters and I could always like connect more to stories out in true stories in the world and our stories and entertainment. Um, and the truth is I wanted to work more hands-on with incarcerated populations. Um, for most of for as long as I can remember than I do today. And I went to um, an individualized study program at NYU called Gallatin, which is where my brother goes now, which I'm very proud of. Um, and I was planning to, to really study work with incarcerated learners. And I had to learn a really challenging thing about self-care. Um, and there were several experiences that I realized like this is actually gonna be like a little too challenging for me, a little too like energetically and emotionally expensive for me to commit to as a career. Um, how else can I be of service and what am I good at? And really had to like at really at the beginning of my junior year, I was like, what like what can I do and implement what I love to do to make the world a better place and to combat the issues, especially the areas of oppression that I care the most about. And with a parents, uh, like parents as well as an education system that kind of supported the like, sure, change your mind, challenge the teacher, like be brave, be wrong. Um, that really like that really helped me feel empowered over my own education. I think it's like so important that we feel like our choices like matter and influence something. When we ask for help and we get help, we're empowered to ask for help again. But when we ask for help and, you know, and our hand is slapped away, it's too scary to ask for help the next time. And then we're more likely to struggle on our own. So, um, yeah, I guess I, that's a long winded way of saying, like, I don't know that I always wanted to be a writer, but I always, um, wanted to tell stories. And I, the last letter that my grandma wrote me, Claire Flom, that I have tattooed right here, but I'll spare you, um, was like to, uh, she said on my 12th birthday, she said um, to my favorite budding author and wordsmith, a deliriously happy birthday. Um, and I think she knew like before anyone else, 
like telepathically that I was going to ultimately do something with words and with writing. But it's so cool. I mean, I wrote this children's book with my dad. I've written this scripted six part audio drama podcast. I've written a web series. I've directed like music videos and animation. And I feel so lucky that I get to be a storyteller and work with words in like such an adaptable way so I can go towards the projects that I feel like are going to um, improve the world and also that I can be most of service to. Um, I think we are um, at a half hour, actually. Um, but uh, and this is fun, and I could go for a long time, but I don't want to overstay our welcome. This person wrote, wherever you are is home, as though you're like some sort of profound, like you say things that people are going to like write down. That's wow. so, that so crazy. That's Such oh. a great message to live by. Joseph Flom's advice he gave to his children to be self-made is something of real importance. Oh, look at you. Yeah. Um, um, and then the last question is, how did this, how are, you, how are you still connected to Gateway? So that's like a perfect way to say that we are as connected to Gateway um, as we are asked to be. Um, Jen Cherney, who organized this, is um, with Nicole Mayan as well. I'm so grateful to both of them. They're just like such unique warrior goddesses um, that when I met them, when we went uh, in to read Lulu, a few years ago and saw the facility, I was so struck with the way that they care about their job, particularly just like institutional advancement with engaging parents and alumni and thinking about how to make Gateway just not just a school, but this like, you know, flourishing, incredible community that my grandma would be so proud of. So we are connected to Gateway in that we are both contactable um, through Jen, through email, through Instagram. Um, and we are really proud to be in your network. Um, I'm sure all your kids are so cool and you're so lucky. And um, yeah, if, it's an honor really yeah, to yeah. be here. I'll just, I'll just leave off with saying that, um, you know, I went to the, I was lucky to be at the Gateway uh, Gala. Um, did you come to that? Like three years ago, five years ago, yeah. Know, yeah. And, it was and just, I went two years ago, right before the pandemic. It was so amazing because it was just one, you know, one incredible uh, success story after another, and um, people, you know, who just literally miracles performed at Gateway on the daily, and it's so rewarding. I mean, you can imagine from my perspective, knowing that my mom I and mean, those are big shoes to fill, but we're both doing our best <laughs> to fill them, and. Uh, you know, a little secret story about my mom too, or a little little unknown, little known story about my mom. She graduated from Cornell when she was 18 years old, so she was always pretty smart. College. Yeah, she used to. She, she was, went to college at 16. She was the first woman from her high school to go to college, and, and then she graduated Cornell in two years. Let's not downplay that. She was a genius. Yeah, she used to remind me about that every week or so yes, <laughs> but yes. anyway well, uh, as I was uh, barely making it through but uh, my educational um, uh, um, I wasn't great I wasn't a great student but um, I was a great student she was a great student so yeah so that was um, that was that and yeah so I so yeah as far as the like I said as far as the innocence project stuff goes I really appreciate people asking about that and taking an interest it, it's the most incredible cause the most rewarding work that I could possibly be involved with the podcast is wrongful conviction the website is innocenceproject.org. And of course, I'm at It's Jason Flom on Instagram, and I'm posting these stories all the time. Avid Instagram user. Yes, I More am. More than me. I am. That's true. I am not. Low key an of, influencer. Not even ashamed of it. Um, and yeah, so please, um, and the book, of, and well, you already know the book is Lulu is Rhinoceros, and it's available everywhere Amazon, Barnes and Noble. I mean, wherever wherever books are sold. Wherever, hey, that sounded good. Wherever books are sold. Thank you. Was, we can't so wait to um, come speak to Gateway students when the world is back open. Thank you, especially like to the our queen Jen Turney. Thank you for inviting us. Yes, and this has been the most seamless, amazing, phenomenal organizational. Probably the best Zoom we've ever done. Zoom, uh, whatever. Not because Zoom of yard. us, but just because of you guys. I've never seen a more efficient, wonderful team. And we really, Huge really. Huge compliment coming from him. Wow. He has really, complaints about most stuff. We really, really appreciate you. We're super honored and humbled to be here today. And I know that my mom is getting, wherever she is, I know she's getting a, uh, a thrill out of this. So thanks for that. And uh, yeah, we'll see you. Uh, we'll see you at the school, I guess. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Should we should we pose? <laughs> what if we just have to hold the pose until they take it off? <laughs>